Welcome to Public Health IT. This will be a lecture on overview and contributing to public health through EHR use. This is Lecture A. The learning objectives for the overview and contributing to public health through EHR use unit are number one, explain what public health is, number two, discuss what distinguishes public health from the other health sciences, and three, explain public health's unique contributions to the health of the public. It has been difficult to define public health, in part because public health is conceptually broad. Public health problems continually change depending on what the needs are of the current day. One way to appreciate the tasks of public health is to understand what public health professionals do. How many of you can refer to yourself as a public health professional? Consider the following. You might be a public health professional if you look to control the most basic of human functions. For example, are you thinking about lobbying the Federal Trade Commission to investigate snack food and soft drink marketing? Are you thinking about promoting a Twinkie tax? Have you been worried about eating, smoking, HIV AIDS, bioterrorism, health literacy, and hand washing all in one day? Do you spend hours per day trying to define yourself, your work, and explaining your work to others? If you have answered yes, then you just might be a public health professional. The Institute of Medicine, IOM, defines a public health professional as a person educated in public health or a related discipline who is employed to improve health through a population focus. We'll talk more about what a population focus means, but for now we will compare the public health population focus to medicine's individual perspective. Medicine's main focus is on the individual, the disease, the treatment, and saving lives one at a time. When compared to public health's population perspective, one might say that in public health the population is the patient. Public health emphasizes prevention and employs an upstream approach that focuses on factors, often referred to as determinants of health, before disease occurs. The public health approach emphasizes health promotion. Health promotion is the process of enabling people to increase control over their health and its determinants, and thereby improve their health. Public health strives to saving lives millions at a time, as compared to the individual focus of treating one individual at a time. Public health strives to prevent epidemics and the spread of disease. Public health aims to protect against environmental hazards, prevent injuries, promote and encourage healthy behaviors, respond quickly and efficiently to disasters, and to assist communities in recovery and to ensure the quality and accessibility of health services. Keep in mind, this does not necessarily mean public health actually provides health services, although some public health agencies do. The role of public health agencies is to assure the quality and accessibility of health services. It is important to understand the basic principles and what motivates public health practice before we even begin to understand how health information technology intersects with public health. Health information technology solutions are derived and inspired by the important needs and problems that are assigned to public health as a discipline. Once these basic principles and needs are understood, it becomes possible to facilitate an approach using HIT that might be better and more efficient than an approach that doesn't rely on health information technology. Some of you may have already learned about the three core functions of public health, assessment, policy development, servicing all functions and assurance, as functions of public health, described by the Institute of Medicine in their landmark 1988 document, The Future of Public Health. Essential services were developed as a companion to these three core public health functions. The Core Public Health Function Steering Committee developed the framework for essential services in 1994. The essential services provide a working definition of public health and a guiding framework for the responsibilities of local public health systems. First, assessment includes monitoring health status in order to identify health issues within the community and diagnosing and investigating health problems and hazards within the community. Policy development includes informing and educating people about health issues and mobilizing community partnerships to solve health problems 
and developing policies and plans. Finally, we get to assurance, which includes enforcing laws and regulations that protect health and ensure safety. In addition, its objects are to link people to health services and assure care, assure a competent public health and healthcare workforce, and to evaluate effectiveness of programs. Researching for new, innovative solutions to health problems is a service that serves all functions. Just take a moment at this time to review the three core functions and the ten essential services and consider how important data, information, and knowledge, and collectively health information technology becomes to public health as it strives to meet the ten essential public health services. The next few slides will present an overview of the issues and problems that introduce major threats to the health of the public in our current day. There is little doubt that you are all aware of smoking as a major health threat, but perhaps you may not realize how significant a health risk smoking is to our population. Smoking is the leading preventable cause of mortality in the United States. One out of every five deaths can be linked to smoking. 443,000 individuals die annually as a result of smoking. While we have made strides towards aiding individuals to quit smoking in the U.S., there are still approximately 3,000 children smoking their first cigarette every day. 20% of teens continue to smoke. 6 million teens smoke in spite of the knowledge that smoking is addictive and leads to disease. These numbers provide an example of how complex the job of public health is. That simply educating the public about health risks is insufficient. Knowledge alone does not lead people to reduce their health risk behaviors. Some of you might be familiar with the Healthy People 2010 report. This report is produced by the United States Department of Health and Human Services to promote science-based, 10-year national objectives for promoting health and preventable disease. Healthy People 2020 is now being prepared. In that document, there are several objectives related to smoking. One is to increase recent smoking cessation success using evidence-based strategies by adult smokers. Another objective is to increase tobacco screening in healthcare settings, office-based ambulatory care settings, hospital ambulatory care settings, and dental care settings. Smoking has long been the number one leading cause of preventative deaths in this country. Obesity is soon climbing to be a close second. Currently, 67% of American adults are overweight. More than one-third are obese. In 2006, for the first time in history, there were more obese people than overweight people in the United States. Predicted by 2018, if nothing has changed, 43% of Americans will become obese. One in three Americans will develop diabetes, and this may be the first generation of American children who are not as healthy as their parents. Obesity is a priority public health problem. Healthy People 2020 has several objectives designed to combat obesity in this country. Examples shown include preventing inappropriate weight gain in children, adolescents, and adults. And to increase the proportion of primary care physicians who regularly assess the body masses of patients in adults, children, and adolescents. Combating infectious disease continues to be a major public health problem. Today, preventing and controlling the pandemic flu and other infectious diseases are a priority. There are 39 new infectious diseases that have been identified over the past 40 years, including HIV-AIDS, Ebola, and SARS. The threat to public health by way of infectious disease continues to be a major public health concern. Older infectious diseases, including malaria and tuberculosis, have mutated and developed increased drug resistance. The flu kills approximately 36,000 Americans and hospitalizes approximately 200,000 each year. Currently, more than 1 million Americans are living with HIV-AIDS, with an estimated 40,000 new cases each year. Healthy People 2020 has several objectives to address infectious diseases, Increasing routine vaccinations coverage levels for adolescents with vaccine recommended by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, for example. Other examples are shown on this slide. 
preparing for health emergencies and bioterrorism attacks has become a major public health problem, particularly since September 11, 2001. Health emergencies pose some of the greatest threats to our nation, are difficult to prepare for and difficult to contain. There has been some progress made since 2001, but problems still remain in our readiness to respond to large-scale emergencies and natural disasters. Many reports indicate that the U.S. is insufficiently prepared to protect people from disease outbreaks, natural disasters, or acts of bioterrorism. Since this has emerged, it continually maintains a position of high priority for the public health. Health disparities are also an extremely important threat to our public's health. The death rates, for example, for African-American adults in 2001 were 29 percent higher than for whites. The rates for strokes are 40 percent higher among African-Americans than for whites. African-American males are over twice as likely to die from prostate cancer. There are more uninsured Americans, 13 percent are white, 22 percent are African-American, and 36 percent Latino. Chronic disease is the leading cause of death and the primary driver for health care costs in America. Currently, the United States spends more than any other industrialized nation on health. Over 75% of these costs are linked to chronic diseases that can be prevented and delayed. For example, by modifying behaviors such as smoking and reducing obesity among Americans. 96% of Medicare expenditures are spent for patients with multiple chronic diseases. The Healthy People 2020 proposes four major overreaching goals to address threats to the public's health. One is to eliminate the preventable diseases, disabilities, injury, and premature death. Second, to achieve healthy equity, eliminate health disparities. Third, to create social and physical environments that promotes good health for all. Finally, to promote healthy development and healthy behaviors at every stage of life. Now that we've taken a look at some of the major threats and priorities for public health, this might be a good time to once again contrast medicine to public health. Medicine as a profession is largely focused on the best outcome for an individual and specifically with the needs of sick individuals. Although this is a very important mission for medicine, it does little to prevent people from being sick in the first place. It's been said that while medicine focuses on saving lives one at a time, Public health has populations in mind and focuses on saving millions of lives at a time. Three points are most important to understanding population-based prevention, which is the foundation of public health. First, disease risk is conceived of as a continuum rather than a dichotomy. There is no clear division between risk of disease and no risk for disease with regard to levels of risk factors. For example, blood pressure, cholesterol, physical activity, diet, and weight. People don't have blood pressure, yes, or blood pressure, no. They have levels of blood pressure that puts them on a continuum of risk. Any population model of prevention recognizes that there are degrees of risk, rather than just low extremes, extreme risk, and no risk. Second, when you stratify a population along the continuum, what forms is a bell curve? The majority of the population will fall in the middle. With a large enough population, only a small number of any population will fall at the tail ends of the bell curve, the extremes for low to high or high to low risk. Jeffrey Rose, 1981-1992, an epidemiologist famous for defining the population prevention strategy, observed in his work that exposure of a large number of people to a small risk can yield a more absolute number of cases of a condition, for example diabetes or heart disease, than exposure of a small number of people to a high risk. This understanding argues for public health strategies that focus on the modification of risk for the entire population, rather than for specific high-risk individuals. 
This slide provides an example of a strategy that intervenes only on the proportion of the population that is at most risk based on high levels of body mass index, BMI. A high BMI number indicates overweight or obesity. This graph shows a clinical intervention that focuses on the tail end of the population distribution, the proportion of the population that is at highest risk due to high BMI. The second slide is an example of a population-based prevention strategy. According to this strategy, the greatest benefit is achieved by shifting the entire distribution of risk to a lower level of risk. Because most people are in categories of moderately elevated risk, as opposed to very high risk, this strategy offers the greatest benefit in terms of reducing risk at a population level. A third important point for understanding population-based prevention is an individual's risk of illness cannot be considered separate from the disease risk for the population in which he or she belongs. For example, someone in the United States is more likely to die prematurely from a heart attack than someone living in Japan. Because the population distribution of high cholesterol in the United States as a whole is higher than the distribution in Japan. It is not surprising then to learn that when people from Japan move to the United States, they actually begin to adopt the risk profile of the people living in the United States. A people's health or disease risk is in part determined by where they live. Applying the population-based perspective to a health measure means asking why a population has the existing distribution of a particular risk, in addition to asking why a particular individual got sick in the first place. This perspective takes into account determinants of health, which include where is the person living, what their environment is like, cultural factors, socioeconomic factors, for example, financial status, crime in one's neighborhood. This slide is from Healthy People 2020 and summarizes the determinants of health. This figure helps us to think about the multiple determinants of population health. Understanding and ultimately improving a population's health rest not only on understanding this population perspective, but also on understanding the interconnectedness of determinants such as individual behavior, community, living conditions, and broad social, economic, cultural, and environmental conditions. The action model in this figure demonstrates that interventions, for example policies, programs, and information, impact the determinants of health at multiple levels to improve outcomes. Results of the interventions are shown through assessment, monitoring, and evaluation. Through dissemination of evidence-based and best practices, these findings feed back to intervention planning to enable the identification of effective prevention strategies in the future. Public health interventions are designed to impact determinants of health at several levels. For example, gains in the control of infectious diseases rested upon understanding the power of environmental interventions. In areas where sanitation and water purification are poor, individual behaviors, such as hand washing and boiling of water, are used to reduce the spread of disease. Public health and medicine differ in their use of diagnostic tools. For example, typical tools of medicine include the thermometer, stethoscope, individual data, and medical history. The tools of public health include vital statistics, epidemiology, and surveillance. Epidemiology is defined as the study of the distribution and determinants of disease in populations to seek the causes of both health and disease. In this slide, we see an example of the kinds of interventions, some planned and others not specifically planned, but nonetheless have had an impact on cigarette consumption in the United States. For example, Great Depression in the 1920s through the 1930s increased cigarette consumption. Declines in cigarette consumption began following the first Surgeon General's report that publicized the hazards of cigarette smoking to health. Decline continued when the non-smokers' rights movement began, the ban on ads, increases in cigarette taxes, and the master settlement agreement that occurred between the four largest U.S. tobacco companies and the attorneys general of 46 states. 
The states settled their Medicaid lawsuits against the tobacco industry for recovery of their tobacco-related health care costs and also exempted the companies from private tort liability regarding harm caused by tobacco use. In exchange, the companies agreed to change their tobacco marketing practices and to make payments to the states to compensate them for some of the medical costs of caring for persons with smoking-related illnesses. The Money Funds and Anti-Smoking Advocacy Group This is an example of a powerful public health intervention. In summary, we defined what public health is and provided the core functions of public health. In addition, we discussed how the basic principles of public health can facilitate an appreciation on how HIT can improve public health practices. We reviewed the important public health problems such as smoking, obesity, infectious diseases emergencies, health disparities, and chronic disease.